this mix will enable us to have very active and useful sessions in our regular meetings on a wide range of interesting topics. The young and the old will definitely be benefited and enriched by this. The first of our masterclass session being organized today is on a very interesting topic, crucial in today's world, clean air and climate change, challenges in the automotive industry. I am sure you are all looking forward to listen to the speaker, Mr. N.C. Shagaran, who is my contemporary in CET and a multifaceted person. Mr. Shagaran has several years of experience in the oil and related industry, having worked with some of the leading multinationals and is still going strong. He is also one of the most popular persons in the Sita Mumbai group, ever willing to help all with his timely advice and suggestions. Now, I take pleasure in inaugurating our first session of Sita Mumbai Masterclass. Thank you all once again and wishing you all a very pleasant evening. Loka Samasta Subhino Bhavandu. Thank you, Natarajan, sir, for those kind words. We apologize to everyone in case the video was off in between. We are also doing it for the first time. So, as we go, we learn. This is all about knowledge and this is all about learning. So, moving on, it's time to introduce the masterclass speaker of the day, Mr. N.C. Shagrin. N.C. Shagrin, sir, as we call him, or N.C.S. sir, as we call him, as Natarajan sir rightly pointed out, is one of the most helpful people in the CET group. You want to go to Kerala, you want to go to Delhi, you want a pass, you want a visa, you want a passport, just let him know, he'll get it done. He's got connections, or as he himself calls it, people in high places who just cannot say no to him. And he, I'll shamelessly say, have been using those powers vested on him for our own use. And I think a lot of us in Mumbai have benefited from his wisdom. Now coming to the topic, climate change and the role of the automotive industry. Now just look out of your window. Just uh, like I stay in Thane, I can see as far as the Dorivelli Hills, the picture of the forest and the trees are much more clearer, much more sharper. The earth is rejuvenating. Due to COVID, all of us are locked in and the earth is on a rejuvenation spree. I think Mother Earth is having the last laugh at us and this is the biggest signal given to us. And to tell us more about this, I introduce Mr. N.C. Shekharan, sir. N.C. Shekharan, N.C.S. sir. To take over the, the screen, the stage is all yours, sir. We look forward to a wonderful talk. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hear me? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, good evening, uh, friends, ladies, and gentlemen. Thank you all for this uh, rare honor of uh, having me as the very first speaker. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, put on the uh, um, PowerPoint presentation, but before that, uh, before that, I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, acknowledge and uh, thank a few people. Um, firstly, uh, I want to, um, you know, thank uh, Ajit Kumar, Bappan, um, uh, Pratap, and and the entire team of people from <clears throat> City Mumbai who, uh, you know, have been uh, responsible for organizing this, putting this together and um, you know actually conducting this uh, very bold uh, uh, shall we say exercise of having these kind of lectures so uh, that's a great effort um, um, it's uh, really uh, something that uh, we uh, we can uh, you know do uh, especially at this kind of time when most of us are at home not having so much to do so giving it back uh, our knowledge back to some of the younger people uh, i think is a very very noble um, you know, endeavor, and I'm extremely happy to be part of that. Uh, two of my, uh, at this time, uh, my um, uh, memories go back to 
that little building on the hill called the CET where we all studied. And uh, our, the string that connects all of us here uh, is that is CET. So uh, I, I want to acknowledge um, all that we received from that institution in terms of all the skills and capabilities and uh, everything that we received from them, which made us good people, good engineers. Now, an institution, uh, uh, you know, and we have very, very successful people who came out of that institution. I'm not going to repeat those names. You all know them. So that's only one judgment of an institution. I think there's also an important, another important judgment as to how much uh, has an institution or a college enabled or has succeeded in imparting skills and competencies to ordinary people, not very high scorers, not high performers. So if you take my case, I'm definitely not a high performer. I was not a high performer and I'm not a high scorer. Uh, almost bottom of the barrel stuff. I had my own encounters with uh, supplementary exams, my own difficulties with the session marks. And okay, that's another life. We are all that. But now, after what, 30 years of uh, working in the industry and uh, you know, working with some <clears throat> very, uh, shall we say, global uh, competitive kind of companies, if you ask me professionally, if you look at your last 30 years, I'm sorry, it's not 30 years, it's 50 years. Uh, 1971, I passed out, so it's 50 years, it's going to be 50 years. <clears throat> if you ask me, um, how was it? Uh, was it satisfactory? My uh, unstinted, undoubtful answer is yes. I'm extremely, in a professional sense, extremely happy with what I did. So this institution has given, not only just, has not only just produced some star, shall we say, you know, high visibility individuals, it has also enabled very ordinary people like me to, to, to rise in life and come to a, a level where the technical knowledge and the experience gained is getting used in some manner. Okay. And uh, that's, not, that's not all. I think uh, I've been a member of this group now for about uh, a few months. I've been more active, as uh, Patty said, I've been more active now because of the COVID. So um, there are things that we can see. There are, uh, you know, there is a value system that exists within this group, and and that's true for uh, you know all the other groups also. When you when you meet people from your uh, this college, you see a value system here, and I don't want to get into I don't want to spoil it by defining that value system, but it's something very unique, and it's something I am very proud of, uh, and I'm sure all of you are also proud of that in the same uh, way. So again, we got that from that parent institution. So I want at this moment to register my profound gratitude and thanks to uh, CET, to all those great, uh, you know, uh, members of the faculty, the professors and the lecturers and all those people in the laboratories, in the workshops and the, the people who supported it. I want to thank all of them uh, uh, so that, uh, you know, who gave us in abundance all those things, uh, a mixture of all those things that has made us very successful. So with that little introduction, I would now like to go to my um, presentation. And I'm going to put on a PowerPoint now. Let me try and do that. I hope I succeed. OK. Can you all see that? Yes. Is everyone able to see that? Yes, please go ahead. Ajit? Yes, please okay. go ahead, sir. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I hope you can hear me also. If there is a problem, uh, please, uh, you know, uh, on, on, your, on your scribbling pad or notepad or whatever you call it, please indicate uh, if there is any difficulty. And also your questions. You can keep on asking your questions. Now, um, the topic that we have chosen, I have chosen for today, is something which is very, very close to my heart. I've been in this industry for many decades, and in the last 15 to 20 years, this is a topic that has loomed up very large in this industry, almost challenging the basics of this industry and making us rethink and rethink and re-engineer and, and you know, do things very, very differently uh, to, 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 to be able to respond to this issue, all right? So being a very complicated subject uh, and uh, having a very limited time, uh, to expound it, um, I'm going to be uh, very frugal in the sense that here is the list of contents that we are going to go through, but this is basically uh, my roadmap, okay? 
uh, so that I don't get lost in this jungle of uh, technical and commercial things. So I'm not going to use all the slides I'm going to I have prepared for you. Some I'm going to develop on, and some I'm just going to flip, and some I'll, maybe I'll just mention something in passing. So just to get you familiar with uh, what we're going to do today, we'll start with some very basic concepts of what's clean air and what's climate change. So explain to you uh, some basic fundamentals of that, which I'm sure most of you know. Uh, so we, we get a vocabulary uh, and some of the basic concepts in place. And then we talk about uh, some of the things that are happening in India. Okay, on the same front, uh, uh, we will ex I will explain what, what I mean by leapfrog to BS6. Uh, this is basically uh, enabling legislation and laws which have been passed in this country to achieve those, uh, you know, objectives of clean air and, uh, you know, climate change. Uh, uh, then we will look at uh, what is the impact of all this legislation on the auto industry. I'm looking at this from a very, shall we say, uh, limited uh, viewpoint, which is from the auto industry, and predominantly uh, from vehicles and stuff like that. So we look at uh, you know, what's happening on the fuel quality, enabling uh, us to be able to meet the specification. We look at IC engine design a little bit, and also the regulations on CO2 emissions, and then uh, end with some future challenges. Okay, clean air. Uh, when you talk about clean air, uh, we need to first identify what are the pollutants we are talking about. So the two subjects we are talking about, one is uh, clean air and one is uh, climate change. So in clean air, we are going to look at suspended particulate matter, okay? PM is a short, short, short form of particulate matter. Now, these are very small ones, which are PM10 and PM2.5. The number indicates the size, it's in microns, 10 to the power of minus six of a meter. So um, very, very small. So we're going to talk about that, and they are suspended particulate matter. And to complicate a little more, they are also respirable, which means they are capable of being respired, which are being capable of being inhaled by us when we breathe. So some people call them RSPM, resp respirable suspended particulate matter. Okay. So different names, but the same thing. We're going to talk about oxides of nitrogen. Okay, which basically um, come out of uh, the exhaust of IC engines, predominantly diesel engines. Uh, we're not going to spend any time on ozone and VOC. Uh, and in climate change, there is just one uh, pollutant that IC engines from the auto industry that we, we emit, which is carbon dioxide. Things like methane and other, other greenhouse gases are not enough. So that's exactly the pollutants that we're going to talk about. Now, what is particulate matter? I'm going to a slide uh, of uh, a prestigious agency called the EPA, United States Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so they define particulate matter as something which can be a liquid or a solid, uh, but they're extremely small, okay? And they cannot be seen by the naked eye. And you require an electron microscope to be able to see them. So here is an example. Uh, all of you have been to the beach. Many of you uh, must be, of course, recently none of us have been. But in the good days, when we were taking the children or the grandchildren to the beach, and then we used to come back and touch the sand from them, with grains of sand, so that little grain of sand is about uh, 90 microns, okay? You can see that on the, on, on the left side there in the, in the little diagram there, that's the size of one granule of sand. The hair on our head is having a diameter typically of about 70 microns. So compared to that, the particles we are talking about are much smaller, they're 10 microns and 2.5 microns. So when we say PM 2.5, it's all the particles which are 2.5 micron and less. And when we talk about PM 10, it's all the, all the particles, uh, particulates, which are less than 10 microns, uh, um, uh, 10 micron and less, and which will also include 2.5. Now, the problem with uh, some of these respirable uh, particulate matter, especially the 2.5, is that it can transport itself across the mucous membrane in the alveoli, which is inside your lung. Uh, that is the membrane which is rich in capillaries where the oxygen, uh, shall we, a gas exchange takes place. So um, the um, oxygen gets absorbed into the blood and the carbon dioxide is, uh, you know, rejected and the, and the air carries through it. Now this, this being such a small thing can very easily transport itself through that little membrane, the 2.5 micron thing. So it's successful now in transporting itself from the pulmonary system, which is the breathing, uh, the, the lung, to the circulatory system. 
And, and the problem is that this can never ever be expelled from the human body, whether it's in the pulmonary system or in the circulatory system. And there is sufficient proof now that these are carcinogens. They can induce cancer, both 2.5 and 10. So this is really the battle that we're fighting. Now, the health effects, I don't want to get into too much detail because this is a very, you know, kind of a scary page. So starting with, uh, you know, the breathlessness, uh, irritation, coughing, it goes all the way to COPD, which is a disease which requires oxygen. You have to keep oxygen cylinders at home if you suffer from this disease. And then you get into, uh, you know, a terminal disease like, like a ischemic uh, heart disease and carcinoma. Okay, so those are the after effects of those uh, pollutants. I'm sure you're familiar with this chart, so I won't get into much detail. This is the air quality index. Okay, and we say anything up to 200 is probably okay, but more than 200 is very, very unhealthy. And uh, now this is the EPA. Again, there are several systems uh, parallelly, but the EPA has got their own algorithms. And uh, we, we quite, uh, you know, in India, we follow um, uh, a similar system. So to give an example, in Delhi, typically, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, AQI air quality index of around 400 to 500 or typically many times we have crossed 500 for, you know the scale ends at 500 but in Delhi we have crossed 500 we have gone to 600 and 700 in in Bombay it's probably 100 200 on a good day but the day after Nisarga you remember Nisarga the cyclone that skipped Bombay mercifully and you know went away uh, the day after that I refer to the Suffer Suffer is one of the websites that records uh, AQI Bombay had single digit AQI, it was seven. Most of Bombay had seven. So, you know, that tells you, that tells you very clearly. And all during these three months when the vehicles were not running, as Papan said, you can look out, you can see the hills. People from Bihar were able to see the Mount Everest and things like that. So, so the, there is a, a huge contribution that the IC engine, the vehicles are making to air quality index. Okay, and, and uh, there, are, there are lobbies who will uh, want you to believe that's not true. But let me tell you that this three months has been a great experience for us. Now, in India, uh, this is from a, from a website of an NGO called the ICCT, International Council on Clean Transportation, uh, American NGO. But there's a lot of work in India and comes up with excellent data here. So uh, air pollution is, uh, according to them, the fifth leading cause of mortality. And there's a Lancet study Lancet is a, is a medical magazine, very prestigious, very professional medical magazine printed uh, in the UK. Uh, I have some details later, we'll talk, go to that. And according to uh, ICCT, typically um, uh, transportation, which is all the IC engine uh, powered vehicles, contribute about a third of the particulate matter uh, emissions. Okay, and little higher, maybe 40% of the NOx emissions. And if you, just to give you the idea of uh, the vehicles, 10 million vehicles we had uh, 10 years back, a little more than 10 years back. And last year we sold 24.5 million vehicles. This is sales, of which 21 million is about uh, two wheelers, uh, about, yeah, about 21 million, and about two million is fast, fast car, and the remaining is heavy duty, uh, commercial, uh, light, light commercial vehicles, so on and so forth. But uh, if you look at the vehicle part, and this is a very difficult figure to estimate because there are no authentic figures available. So help, with the help of the oil industry, I was able to take out this figure, is 250 million vehicles. So in other words, we are keeping a stock. Our park is about 10 years production based on last year. But we have been keeping this park. So it's somewhere between actually 12 to 15 years vehicles are there. So we must remember this number very clearly because whatever we do today, you know, cannot have a major effect unless all those 250 million vehicles, you know, go away. And we'll talk about that in a little more in detail. Uh, so let's understand climate change. So this is National Geographic, again, a magazine that um, everyone uh, trusts and believes, uh, you know, a magazine that we all look forward to, uh, children, us, older people. Um, so according to them, it's a long-term alteration of temperature and weather patterns, okay? And specifically, it, where it relates to the rise in global surface temperature from pre-industrial era, which is 1850 to 1900 AD. That is defined as the pre-industrial era, to the, to the present. 
And um, so, so you know, the, uh, earlier we were using a word called global warming. Now, what is that? Has it gone away? No, it has not gone away. So global warming is one of the aspects of this, and climate change is a resultant of that. It's something like cost. The cost is really emission of uh, greenhouse gases. So global uh, warming uh, does not completely portray the damage that this phenomenon can uh, inflict on humankind. So it was, I think, NASA of USA which suggested that we use the word climate change and we, which has got a more profound uh, you know, definition of the damage it can create. So today we are using the climate change. But the focus is still on the temperature increase. Uh, it, have, it can be re, uh, local, it can be national, it can be regional. And the difficulty is that apart from the hardship that uh, this thing, uh, you know, uh, thrusts upon people, now agriculture or uh, cultivation becomes extremely difficult because you have, you have great difficulty in, in uh, anticipating at what time the rains are going to come or what temperature is going to come. In a country like India, you basically depend upon the monsoon. So that becomes unpredictable, then it has got a serious impact on cultivation. Uh, also, uh, simultaneously, we also see severe weather events. So severe weather events are uh, things like a very heavy downpour, cyclones, storms, uh, and floods. So uh, just about what, two weeks back, we had two cyclones, Amphan in the Bay of Bengal, causing a severe damage to Calcutta and uh, uh, West Bengal. And then Nisarga coming up on the Arabian Sea all the way down from uh, the coast of Kerala and uh, you know, was, was uh, uh, targeting Bombay, Mumbai, but at the last moment, suddenly we got off at the Alibag and with some minor damage, uh, you know, uh, sort of fizzled out. So this is very, 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 very rare. We, don't, we can't have, we, don't, we didn't have two cyclones coming up in such short notice and the Arabian Sea has never had a major cyclone. So we are seeing all these changes. Kerala, we had a flood in August 2018, severe flood. I had my own relatives, three of them, old people had to be shifted from their houses uh, near the Chalakudi Pura. They had to be taken by boat to a rescue, to a relief center. Last year, the rains again, there was a problem. In Bombay, we have had a very severe precipitation. So these are all the various facets of climate change. And we, we just can't wish them away. They're here, they're not going to go away. And that's what this talk is all about. Now, I, I will talk about IPCC a little later, but the left, the, the, the pie diagram on the left is from IPCC, which is Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a UN a body, a UN, uh, uh, shall we say, secretary. Eh? And uh, this is the, the inventory of greenhouse gases, what is emitted from uh, various uh, sources. And if you look at the, and on the right side, I'll try to compile what is possible for India. Uh, so the difference is uh, in automotive or transportation is 14% global and we are 16%. So it's about the same uh, range. But the major difference comes in power generation. The, work, the global is only 25%. Here we have 61%. And that debate is not part of this uh, talk today. But another day we can pick up that debate why it's so. So 15% uh, is there from uh, transportation. The, the first uh, initiative. Uh, was the Kyoto Protocol, which was, uh, uh, you know, uh, back in uh, 1997. Uh, uh, and this is the, the United Nations uh, um, Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. And that was the famous uh, Kyoto Protocol, which attempted to, to, to portray uh, the, the effect of greenhouse gases and a general caution that we must reduce the, the emission of these things. And from there, uh, you know, uh, uh, we went to the Paris Accord which really happened in 2016. The meetings took place between November and December of uh, 2015. And uh, the Paris Accord was uh, finally formalized and signed in November 2016. And, and there, the, the, the whole focus was very clearly laid that we must now try to limit global uh, warming or the surface temperature increase to two degrees Celsius from the middle, 20, uh, from the 19, um, 1850 to 1900. Uh, you know, age, and if possible, we must try to contain it within 1.5 degrees Celsius. And there are different scenarios there. Now, what is important in the Paris Accord is that every nation, and there were 196 signatories, every nation had to give what is known as a nationally determined contribution, NDC, including India. 
And then, of course, the IPCC has been then formally recognized as the body which is responsible for assessing climate change and making recommendations and advising governments and so on and so forth. And uh, then, of course, the most recent event was uh, in September uh, when the UN Climate Eco uh, Action Summit was held in New York in the, in the United Nations uh, may, uh, you know, head office. Uh, and uh, there, uh, a 19 year old schoolgirl by the name of Greta Thunberg stood up and said, um, made a statement that, how dare you? Uh, and this, she was addressing the senior people, people of my generation, and uh, statesmen, and saying, how dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood uh, with your empty words. So here is the anguish. And here, this is really the human face of uh, climate change. Here is an anguish from a Swedish school girl about, about uh, the seriousness of climate change that it is capable of completely eliminating human life from this planet. It's not attended to. And we are now depending on the younger generation. We are passing it on to them. And, you know, the, 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 the shall we say, the hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, giga, the tons of carbon dioxide which has been emitted in the past, we are hoping that science will come up with a remedy to convert that, suck it back and convert that to uh, something which is... Uh, sort of uh, less harmful and that's the dream uh, so this it's really uh, uh, indicative of where we are today on the track so uh, as far as india is concerned the ndcs uh, the ndcs are uh, reduce the intensity of uh, uh, emission uh, sorry the emission intensity of gdp by about 33 to 35 percent so for every dollar of gdp that india uh, you know as or will, will produce, you need to define that there will be so many tons or grams or kilograms of carbon dioxide. And you have to have a reduction with this year 2005, you have to reduce it by 33 to 35%. Most people feel that uh, that is possible. Uh, we need to achieve a 40% power generation from non fossil fuel. So, non fossil fuel is nuclear, uh, hydro, hydro, um, you know. Um, uh, solar and all the all that kind of thing. We are very close to that today. We are pretty pretty close to 40 percent. And these are the targets for 2030. So it's something that I think uh, we probably will be able to reach. And then uh, uh, create an additional carbon sink of about 2.5 to 3 gigatons uh, carbon dioxide to fresh forestation. And that's very ambitious because today, even if you start with doubling the rate of uh, afforestation. Is going to be very tough. Okay, then in the climate pledge, which was made in the same meeting that Greta Thunberg, uh, you know, said, "How dare you?" In the same meeting, the Indian Indian delegation, led by the Prime Minister, made a promise that we will have 450 gigawatts of renewable energy source in 2030. You know, that is astounding because today the grid is about 370 gigawatts, and we discussed this during the time when the grid was almost collapsed. Uh, and many of us had discussed this in our uh, Bombay uh, you know, group. So uh, we have uh, about 7,400 maybe it is, and about, uh, about 100, a little more than 100 uh, gigawatts of uh, um, you know, non-fossil uh, fuel, including hydrogen. Now, to talk about creating fresh 450 uh, uh, gigawatts of renewable energy in the next uh, you know, 18 years uh, is a little astounding, but this is the promise that India has made. And then I've given some numbers there, so I think that we can, we can forget that, not important. Now let's come back to India and talk about a uh, little bit about uh, the leapfrog. So the leapfrog is all about getting into a tougher specification. Now, before we get into that, we must understand what, where are we in India today in terms of both clean air and climate change. We said that these are very dangerous things. These are going to uh, have impact on large uh, sections of the population, uh, including, uh, you know, a pointer that is capable of uh, even, you know, extinguishing life on Earth. It's that serious. Uh, many people think so. Now, what really is happening now? What are the reports? I've just take, taken a few reports from fairly reliable sources that I would like to place before. Okay. Um, this is a little controversial because the government always says, no, no, this is not true. We don't accept it. So, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to delve in detail on that, but just to make you understand where we are. 
the Lancet Commission. We talked about that. The Lancet Commission, uh, Lancet is a, is, a, is, a, is a medical, professional medical magazine from the UK. So they did a study in 2015 and published in 2016. Every year they repeat that study. And according to that, uh, 6.5 million people died prematurely due to air quality. And we're just talking about particulate matter and uh, oxides of matter, nothing else. Okay, external air quality. 6.5 million people in the world died prematurely. They would have lived a little more. Um, so that's the definition of premature death. And half of that, about three, more than three million, was between India and China, the most, the two most populous nations on, on the surface of the earth. And the number for India, I've not quoted here because it's controversial, is 1.2 million. 1.2 million, according to Lancet, people died in India due to, prematurely due to air quality. Okay, um, so I will not make any comment more than that. Uh, this is this magazine is available. You can go to the website. You can you can read it. The current editions are, are there. Um, then in 2018, the World Health Organization, which is, which is under the United Nations uh, body, uh, they create they they brought out a report called the Ambient Air Pollution Report, and we had the the, the you know uh, shall we say the bad reputation in India. And it was out of the 20 worst polluted cities in the world, 15 were in India. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a you know a, a, a really serious serious situation. And uh, for your information, all these 15 are in the northern part of India. Not even one city in southern India is there. Uh, and this includes our capital also. So um, you know that's fairly um, uh, a serious uh, matter. And uh, uh, if you look at climate change, I'm just going to refer to one report by the World Bank, which came in uh, 2018, about two years back, <clears throat> that if we, if we continue with the scenario of current uh, CO2 emissions without abating them, okay, then in 2050, we are going to have a serious situation where 600 million people, which is at that time, maybe the population of India will be probably 1.5, 1.7, 1.8 billion people at the time, you know, it's, it's, uh, 2050. So nearly one third of the population of India are going to be impacted. And what are they going to be impacted with? They're going to be impacted with very high temperatures and starvation of drinking water or shortage of drinking water. And uh, seven hotspots have been identified, which is all in the central uh, part of India, all the mining areas, which you know, and uh, this is capable of uh, taking away 2.8 percent of the GDP of India. So uh, I don't want to talk more about that. So with that background, the government made a decision to leapfrog from BS4 to BS6. So leapfrog is you skip BS5 and directly go to BS6. This decision was made on the 6th of January evening, 2016, um, and it was, we were given uh, just about uh, four years uh, to. In 2020, March 31st or April 1st of 2020, the, the entire country had to move to BS6. So let's understand what this means. Um, these are the these are the limits given by this very stringent emission norm or legislation. Uh, it defines two uh, two pollutants, as we have seen earlier: the particulate matter and the oxides of matter. And the unit is grams per kilowatt hour. So one kilowatt hour is one uh, an engine of one kilowatt running for one hour. Okay, that's supposed to produce that many grams of that pollute. So we were at about 3.5 uh, nOx and about 0 0.02 uh, pm in uh, back in uh, 2070 when the whole country became BS4. And now from April 1st we have become 0 0.4, almost a 90 percent reduction in particular uh, nOx. I'm sorry and 50% reduction in particular matter. Very, very, very severe. So the two things that we have done in India is that we have gone into a serious uh, improvement of diesel fuel quality. I don't want to get into too many details on that. CTA number has increased. Sulfur has come. That's the main thing. From 10,000 ppm of sulfur in good old days, we have now come down in Euro 4 to 50 ppm parts per million, and now to 10 ppm. T95 uh, is again a temperature uh, at which a certain distillation takes place. Now that has been tightened. And uh, PAH, the polycyclic uh, aromatic hydrocarbon, which is carcinogenic, is a limit put on that. 
So in, in short, the fuel you are getting today, I'm talking more about diesel because the challenges are more on this. It's much, much better than what you were getting earlier and causes less pollution. Now, um, this is, as I said, on April 1st, and the refinery has spent 80,000 crores in all this upgradation from Euro 1 for BS1 to BS6. That's about $12 billion. And the automotive industry, in trying to design the engines and, and put after treatment devices and stuff like that, have also spent a similar type of, uh, you know, money. So coming to the, the, the main topic now, what is affecting the auto industry, just to give you, uh, uh, and I'm not getting into too much technical detail, uh, because this is more of mechanical engineering. This is the IC engine, the diesel engine, for example, and the, what are the changes now? What, what major changes have taken place? The pistons, we used to have single piece aluminum pistons, we have got to two piece pistons. So it's got a steel cap and an aluminum spur. We have moved the rings up, we have moved the rings closer to the higher temperature area because we want to reduce the crevice volume and reduce the emissions. So the rings are now running hotter, aluminum cannot survive that temperature, so the top is now made of steel. On the fuel injection side, we were using good old fuel injection technology, Bosch kind of technology, and today we have gone for what is known as CRDI, Common Rail Direct Injection, which is working at a pressure of 2000 bar. You require those high pressures because you need to atomize the diesel fuel now to much finer so that the combustion is complete. Then, of course, we have turbocharging and the turbocharge, uh, because you want much higher uh, sort of um, combustion efficiency and more horsepower coming out of the same liters of engine volume. So you turbocharge and the air gets hot after the compressor. So you cool it with a charge air cooler. Okay, so those are the different things as compared to the previous engines. Completely different. And everything is now electronic. You just can't do anything without electronics. Injection is now electronic, timing is electronic, and uh, engine management is now electronic. Apart from that, Euro 6 says, or BS6 says, that you need to put certain after treatment devices. And we'll just take a very quick look at them uh, because of uh, time shortage of time. Uh, and we also need what is known as an OBD, which is an onboard diagnostic uh, setup. Okay, it's a mini, uh, shall we say, uh, intelligent computer thing, which is continuously recording all the parameters, including the emissions, how much of NOx is going out, how much of particles matter is going out, and stuff like that. So these are the changes. Um, EGR is a technology where we take out the, the, the exhaust gas and put it back part of it into the inlet. We try to reduce the flame temperature of the diesel combustion. And if you reduce the, diesel, the flame temperature, you can get little benefit on the NOx emissions. But the major two devices that we are now going to put on the engines, one is called a selective catalytic uh, reduction, which is called SCR, and the other one is a DPF. So here's a diagram here, that's the diesel engine. You have the exhaust gas coming out from the turbine. You can see the turbocharger on the left side of the, of the picture, and the, and, the, and the line running from there comes to the catalyzed particulate filter, which is the DPF, which takes out all the particles. And then it goes into what is known as a selective catalytic reduction catalyst. And there we have to uh, now inject a solution of urea and water, which is called a add blue. In some cases, it is called diesel emission fluid, whatever you call it, certain reactions take place there. And this, uh, you know, if you just want to take a look at the reactions. Uh, uh, so that is all the oxides of nitrogen on the left side there. Uh, and then they combine with oxygen, they combine with ammonia because the urea gets uh, you know, converted to ammonia and the entire thing is now reduced to inert nitrogen and oxygen, 90% efficiency. So we got rid of all our NOx and this, this uh, DPF there in the previous picture, that has got microcell, it's a ceramic substrate with a microcell and it can store the soot particles, the particulate matter, until such time that there is enough temperature available to burn them off. So instead of emitting now the, the particulate, which is very, very dangerous, uh, we now can convert that into complete carbon dioxide and emit it. So that is short the technology that we are using today. Just one mention about AdBlue because you're going to come across this now. AdBlue is, uh, or uh, BEF, diesel emission fluid, is chemically known as AUS32, which is aqueous urea solution 32. It's got 32.5% of industrial grade urea, not agricult uh, agricultural urea which is used for farming. And it contains the remaining 67.5. Uh, 
dion as well okay so you require reverse osmosis water here and there is a stringent specification to meet uh, the iso triple two four one you can't use agriculture urea you can't use uh, um bell water and the name ad blue is a license given by the german automotive industry okay so those who want to market it under that brand name have to go and take that license otherwise in india we can still market it as def and ad blue now this fluid has to be dispensed along the country throughout the country every truck that comes in to fill diesel has to now fill in this fluid also and there's a separate tank there which is called the ad blue tank into which we put the fluid and as you have seen in the previous diagram <clears throat> that's the tank there okay and from the tank you know it's taken out and uh, injected there so you need to carry that the consumption of this uh, fluid is about 4% 3.5 to 4% the consumption of diesel so if you consume 100 liters of diesel in a in a diesel truck you will end up consuming about 3.5 to 4 liters of ad blue diesel is today priced at about 85 Rupees, I think, eighty-eight, eighty-five rupees is probably the price today. Air blue is priced at about fifty rupees. So there is a, there is now a price. That's the diesel particulate filter. We talked about it, so we won't spend time on that. Just very quickly on carbon. So that was clean air. That was all the stringent things that happen in India, and how the auto industry is, you know, making all those design changes and the devices and the new fluids to meet those stringent. With Euro six, with Bharat six, we are on lead with the the topmost countries of the world. There is no specification more advanced than that. We are on par with the United States. We are on par with the European Union. We are on par with Australia, Japan, and South Korea. Okay, and China is little behind us. They still not been able to convert the entire nation to uh, Euro six. They call it as China six day, uh, and they will be doing it in the next six months. But they are very close to that. Okay. Now on passenger cars, there is a CO2 emission target which was declared on 2017, April 1st of 2017. So there are two targets. For the first, it was 129.8 grams of carbon dioxide to be emitted per kilometer of the vehicle, and this is the first stage. Most of the uh, the passenger car automotives, uh, autom uh, OEMs, were able to manage with a change of uh, lubricant and without too much investment. for the next phase of that where you have to come down to 113 grams of co2 per kilometer is going to come in april next year okay and the cafe fine is um, cafe fine stands for corporate average fuel economy fine so if you take maruti which sells about less than 2 million cars uh, today 1.7 1.8 million cars perhaps you take all their models weight it according to the model number multiply that with the fuel economy and then it should meet that 129.8 and if it is more than that on a on a on a corporate average basis then you have to pay a fine and the fine is 10 lakhs for every violation and 10000 rupees per car per day of course this is a rule i am not yet aware whether this has been uh, actually uh, any money has been yet collected but the rule is very strict and so the next stage is going to be difficult <clears throat> this is for the heavy commercial vehicles the co2 emission loss Uh, no, uh, most countries still don't have any laws. Okay, pass car. Yes, Europe has got a similar kind of law, but in HCV and LCV, we are now taking the lead here. The first phase already came in 2018, very mild. Okay, no, no changes were required. But the next phase is going to come in April 21, which is next year. So both on heavy duty commercial vehicles, uh, diesel commercial vehicles, and uh, uh, gasoline passenger cars. the fuel economy or the co2 emission limits are going to get very stringent in another 9 months by april okay and you know the industry will have to respond by make different types of oils and stuff like that there is also a light commercial vehicle specification coming for the small lcvs and which are carrying the gross weight is less than 12 tons as expected to be issued shortly uh, i've been carrying this light for 4 years and it's not changed so i don't expect it to be issued shortly now uh, it will be expected it will be issued someday okay so um, we are coming to the last slide now uh, hope i'm doing okay on time yes little bit beyond time so what are the challenges and and we started by saying that this topic is about challenges so first is the vehicle scrapping policy as i told you earlier unless there is a proper scrapping of a, a policy the 50 million vehicles parked 
will still continue to emit very high levels of uh, PM and NO NOx. So we need to find a way to scrap older vehicles, give cash incentive for them to scrap and buy the newer, less polluting vehicles. I'm sorry, this slide is a little alphabet soup. I've used too many alphabets here, but I'll try and explain. And I'm not going to take much time here. TCO is total cost of operations. Those who are familiar with that know that TCO is equal to the initial cost of a vehicle plus all the costs that you incur running it, petrol or diesel, uh, maintenance cost, driver salary, everything is TCO. And this is going to increase now for diesel trucks and diesel buses. Why? Because we have got this, this uh, you know, fantastic after treatment devices like the selective catalytic reduction and the diesel particulate filter. Together, they cost probably four to three to five lakhs, depending on the truck. That will be added. You have an OBD, which is like a you know a very intelligent, uh, the first stage artificial intelligence, you can say, which is now controlling the entire process of combustion within the engine. Cost money. And then there is the diesel emission fluid or the ad blue, which is going to be consumed at about 3 to 3.5 to 4% of the diesel uh, consumption. And that costs money. So we are going to see an increase in the total cost of operations. And at some time, the trucks will have to pass it on, so the freight rates and the transportation rates will have to increase because there is no fuel economy benefit here. These are very sophisticated uh, instruments, very sophisticated systems. You can't go with a screwdriver and try to do that. You need to require a laptop computer. You need to go to the, the OBD or the black box, plug in, and then get all your data out of that. Also, gives you the fault code. And using the fault code, you know what to change and what to repair. So. We need uh, surveillance and monitoring. Otherwise, people are cap capable of putting chips there. There are chips available, let me tell you that, which are capable of fooling the OBD and making the OBD believe that everything is fine. Uh, so it's just a, just an, uh, you know, a CD or a chip that is there. So those things that we monitored and surveillance, currently the RTO does not have the kind of knowledge required to do this. Component sensitivity. We talked about 2000 bar pressure in injection today that allows for very, very small clearances. And the quality of the diesel today, with all the muck that is there in the diesel tanks, in the vehicles, that's going to stop injection. We've got a serious problem there. So we need to now define new housekeeping rules, new hygiene rules. Uh, we need to wear gloves when you're opening an engine. We need to probably uh, you know, wear other things that we don't pollute the engine. You don't give anything to the engine. Uh, we require DEF, the availability of diesel emission fluid. It is still not established. The major oil companies have still not established a supply chain for that. And we require a different lubricant because the diesel particulate filter is now, uh, you know, having a great sensitivity, sensitivity to the chemistry of the current lubricant. So we need a separate lubricant. And finally, all this is so complicated. The, the, the OBD will tell that if something is not coming, they'll tell the vehicle, okay, now you are in a limp home mode which means you can now drive 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers to the nearest service station and then the engine cannot be started. Okay, so we need to upgrade the dealerships and the service point to be able to take care of all that. So with that slide, I think I've almost reached the end of my presentation. I'm sorry, uh, uh, I exceeded a little bit of time. So it's open to you now, back uh, Pratap. Ajit, you can take over and if there are questions and time, then we can try and do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rencia, sir. That was really good. And we have some three, four questions. Uh, okay. uh, can I, since there are not too many, can I ask a couple of them to ask you the queries directly? Yes, sir, sir. Anytime. Most welcome. Okay. Mr. Uh, Ramesh Uni, I am now going to allow you to talk. Can you please... Uh, uh, Unmute and raise raise your question. Okay, I think he's not able to get in. So his question is that what yeah. is the effect of PM between ten and 20, ten and two point five micron as an air polluter? One. Then yeah. any, any significance for selecting 10 micron PM as one of the air quality parameters? Okay, uh, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, this is done by the, uh, the WHO. 
the World Health Organization and all the other emission uh, conscious uh, bodies, they sat together <clears throat> and they said that 10 is the right, uh, uh, you know, uh, size uh, for uh, measuring. You can also measure different sizes, but the regulations are mostly for 2.5 and 10. So if you look at the algorithm, uh, you know, you can build an algorithm for different sizes also. But the EPA found that this is the right thing. Now, the, uh, you know, PM10 includes everything less than 10. So PM2.5 is also included in uh, 10. So does that answer the question? Or? He's still on he's, unmute. Uh, he's still on mute. Oh, okay. uh, am I audible? Yes, Mr. Ramesh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this uh, filtration, uh, efficiency filtration is a, is a parameter for deciding this? No, 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 no. See, we are not, we are not filtering this anymore in the sense. Or rather removal. I, I may, I yeah, the, DPF, the DPF has got a, a, a ceramic substrate and there are micro cells in that. So okay. in millions of them, you know, and what happens is during the, the normal uh, combustion, when the particulates come out, irrespective of their size, they go and lodge themselves in these microcells. And in a passive regeneration mode, when the vehicle is running on a highway, there is enough temperature available, so they keep on burning off, okay? Now, what happens in the cities when you have a stop and go uh, kind of traffic, the thermal uh, you know, conditions within the engine may not permit uh, you know, a natural or passive regeneration. Then you have to go and inject fuel directly into the DPF. So now the injection is not only into the engine. We are also sometimes injecting diesel fuel directly into the DPF. So when it starts burning, the temperature is raised and then all these particulates get burned out. So whether it is particulate 10, the engine is capable of producing, uh, 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 you know, the morphology of soot or particulate matter coming out of the engine is very, very diverse. Uh, you can find much larger particle, particulates also coming out. Okay, they are all burned out. So it is really, it doesn't have much to do with the, the capability of filtering. It's much more to do with uh, the health effects of that. Okay. It's not an engineering uh, issue much as much as it's a health issue. 2.5, we understand, as I explained in detail, can uh, transport itself across the pulmonary membrane. Yeah, that, so you that have... is very, very dangerous. Yeah. 10 uh, cannot do that, but 10 once respired, very difficult to extricate that. It always remains okay. within the pulmonary system. Anything larger than that, I guess you can cough it out. That could be one reason. This is a medical thing. I'm not very familiar with that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So there is another question. Two people yes. have asked the same question. I will ask. Okay. I will request Mr. Fasal Muhammad. Uh, yeah. Please unmute Mr. Fasal. I think you are joining us from Africa. Well. <coughs> Hello, good afternoon. This is Fazal here. Yes, Fazal. Good afternoon. Yeah, 1984 electrical match. You see, oh, really? okay. Nice hearing you, sir. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is related to a scenario when, you know, after a decade or so, when we really go out of fossil fuels and we move more, more, more towards other non conventional energy sources yeah. for our automobile. Do yeah. you think a significant change in our pollution levels? I wonder whether how long these technologies have relevance now because there's a huge shift towards uh, moving out of the conventional uh, fossil fuels towards the non-conventional energy. So yeah. will that make a difference? That's the question. Um, yeah, that's a, very, that's a very good question. And if you just look at India, for example, uh, you know, we, 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 our total petroleum uh, production consumption now today is about it's, it's pretty close to about uh, 200 million tons, say about 5, billion, 5 million barrels per day. And 40% of that is a diesel, which is close to 100 million tons. So even if you were to put a 5%, uh, let's say, biodiesel, okay, we are talking about 5% of 100 million, 5 million tons. The total biodiesel available in the country today is not even one, it's not even half a million tons. So there is just not that kind of volume. Then there are methyl esters and you know other synthetics that we were talking about. Um, you know, from the CO2 emission point of view, none of them will help because when you burn any fuel, whether it's uh, whether it's a mineral-based petroleum fuel or whether it is alternate fuel, you ultimately have to end up with CO2. So that cost cannot be. The only thing you can save is 
uh, you can save probably uh, some of the emissions like uh, particulates uh, and some NOx. But what really happens is the particulates come out of hydrocarbon. So even the alternate fuel is hydrocarbon. So the carbon is what is coming as fuel. And how the NOx is formed is that in the, in the supplying the air, there is nitrogen in the air. <clears throat> so that nitrogen combines with oxygen. As you know very well, in a diesel engine, we always supply excess air, unlike in a petrol engine, which operates on stoichiometric ratio. Here, there is so much of oxygen that the nitrogen combines, depending on the flame temperature. So whether you use conventional or, uh, shall we say, alternate fuels, the emission point of view, really, you don't get much benefit. The, the, real, the real next thing, and I, I, I avoided talking about that completely here because uh, there is no time. E-mobility, electric car is going to be the next big uh, game changer. You know, it's already happening in China. I'm sure it will catch up with other countries sh shortly, and including our country here. In electric car, the benefit is that you have no emissions. You have no NOx, you have no particulate matter. Now, depending, uh, when you convert, uh, you know, uh, electrical energy, uh, conversion in a is much much more efficient than IC engine conversion. In a diesel engine, the highest uh, indicated thermal efficiency you can get is about 45 percent, maybe 50 percent. But in an electric conversion, uh, conversion, you can get almost 85 to 90 percent. So even if you are using coal-based uh, electrical energy, but you are converting it at a much higher, uh, so the the joules are converted to kilowatts at a much higher, uh, shall we say, efficiency. So you can really save emissions. But if you are going to now finally replace all that coal burning power generation into non-conventional renewable source of energy, then you have a zero uh, emission situation. So that's a great combination. That's what you know everybody is dreaming about. That we have only these, uh, we are only electric cars, and all electric cars are charged from some renewable source of energy. So we build up enough renewable sources. Then you have no emission. So in that game uh, plan, if you look at it. Alternate fuels are really not going to have much play. One. Two, if you look at the price of crude today, if you look at, don't look at India. In India, when the crude price goes up, the diesel price goes up. You know, India's got a different, uh, you know, um, uh, economy here. But if you look at the, the Middle East, if you look at your own country, when the crude price goes, goes down, your diesel prices come down. So the lower the diesel prices are, any distillate price, if they go, the incentive to create alternate fuels reduces. Okay, so uh, I really personally don't see a, a big role for, uh, you know, um, alternate fuels. Uh, and the only exception to that is in Brazil, where they use a lot of uh, gasoil, which is ethanol mixed with uh, gasoline in a great proportion, and they have the technology to deal with that. So uh, apart from that, I don't personally see a big advantage. Uh, I hope I have answered your question. Yeah, and, and, and thank you, sir. I have uh, some supplementary things, but I'll, I'll reserve it for another occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Fazal. Sir, uh, there are three, four more questions. Uh, yeah. two, two, three of them are from the same person. Uh, oh, okay. So, Mr. Sridhar Ramchandran, I'm, I'm just putting him on, uh, yeah. on the he's, mic. He's, he's my nephew, by the way. Huh? Oh, okay, very good. <laughs> See, he's... Hi, hi. Hi, Abhinagar. Uh, great session. Uh, just a couple of questions uh, I, I had uh, in the interest yeah. of time. Is that one is, uh, how, much, how much do you think the precipitation matters when it comes to PM particulate matter? Because if you, if, when you said the Sarga came and it was seven in Bombay, yeah. and one yeah. of the biggest challenges Delhi has is, has is it's, it's very dry. So yeah. is, that, is that a direct correlation? Um, you look at not a direct correlation. You see, okay, so before Nisarga came, Nisarga didn't bring a lot of precipitation, only very little. Before Nisarga came, the previous day, if you look at sulfur, Bombay was still at about 25, 25, 30. The main reason was the vehicles were not running. DST was not running and uh, cars were not running. So it was already low. When you have that kind of precipitation, the particulate matter suddenly tends to get into liquid, uh, you know, get into the wash by the rain and comes down. And the first thing you can, you can make out is you can see the visibility is much better. Yeah. In Delhi, in Delhi, you've got another problem. That part, a big part of that 500, 600 type of AQI stuff is because of stubble burning in Haryana. Okay. In winter, once the winter crop, uh, you know, the, the, the wheat crop is uh, taken out, 
in they they start burning the stubble because that is the easiest way to get rid of the stubble the roots yeah and that creates carbon now that that also uh, has got its own morphology of particulate 2.5 10 even higher uh, number of particles so that behaves in a different manner okay so um, it might help uh, when you get uh, if you if you see the first rains in delhi which will probably happen any time now uh, and you know the, the aqi does improve a little bit and then it stays on like that uh, till about winter time in november december the next class okay okay yeah uh, the other question one more small question just yes, uh, wanted to uh, was uh, uh, i had written down regarding the chip that you said that you know you can uh, override these ecus and give the yeah. desirable results so is it I, something I, I, what I, I, i didn't say that it's illegal to say that so i just yeah, but, that there, there but is that what vw got into uh, uh, okay. <laughs> okay now nobody is going to take this uh, nobody is going to report this vw created a system where the moment the engine gets into the test mode okay there is a test mode called the whtc the world uh, harmonized yeah. transient cycle you 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 probably learned about that Yeah. yeah. So W, the moment it, it gets into WHTC, the the engine is intelligent enough, intelligent enough to know that now we are undergoing this test. So mm-hmm. it creates the complete parameters have changed, and it behaves like a very good boy with no emission. <laughs> okay. The moment it comes out of WHTC, uh, that means out of the dynamometer, it goes on the road. The engine knows that now there is no test, and it starts uh, over fueling and. timing is changed and you get excellent torque and excellent speed and but a lot of emissions so that is the vw thing so it's a, it's a different version of that it's a different yeah. version of that yeah thank you that's all okay, okay. Uh, there are many queries coming on electric vehicles i think we should have that uh, as a separate session probably yes yes yeah <laughs> so uh, i will I, i will not put those questions at this moment okay um i mean uh, there was one question which yeah. has come from uh, nisha uh, yeah. asking what's the cost for upgrading for the bs6 to the consumer i'm not sure okay. whether you, you can directly answer that or yeah uh, i'll try to answer that so uh, nisha uh, we are talking about the major impact of bs6 is on uh, diesel in petrol okay you have to go uh, to a better quality of catalyst uh so the 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 upgradation is not very very severe there even in the two wheeler the, what they are going to something called euro 5 there which is not which is still uh, the, the european uh, you know specification there uh, and there are also you are not going to get into any serious after treatment devices in any case you cannot afford to have any after treatment device on a scooter there is no space so the the real problem is on the commercial vehicle especially on heavy commercial vehicle and buses now here uh, talking to the oems and i happen to be my company who oh, i forgot to mention that all this uh, the intellectual property for this presentation is uh, my the company that i i represent which is ultra lab you can find the logo on my slides it's a test laboratory it's a uh, you know nabl accredited test laboratory we work with oems uh, like tata motors and ashok lair and all of them and we help them in you know finding solutions to these problems so uh, from that knowledge i can uh, sort of say that if you're talking about the two after treatment devices which is the scr the selective catalytic reduction uh, and the dpf we're probably talking about nisha somewhere between uh, 2.5 to 5 lakh additional cost the obd is also uh, you know very expensive so all together we are talking about perhaps uh, 4 to 5 lakhs minimum cost increase So it's not a very small amount. Okay. Okay. That is uh, um, there. There. There is one question which appeared on the on the um, general chat. Yeah. Uh, that is self-reliance coal production. As developing country, we have fo- we focus more on energy production rather than clean energy. I think this also probably we will. I mean, unless you can directly. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll answer that. Uh, so uh, you, um, who's asking this question, please? This is Shinu C K. Okay. So uh, yes, now in uh, in the Paris Accord, we talked about one word. It's called uh, you know the the 
carbon intensity of GDP. So there is something called uh, climate equity. Climate equity is something that uh, the United Nations uh, bodies and uh, IPCC have always stressed about. So what is climate equity? Climate equity means that nations which are still developing, nations which, whose GDP are not, per capita GDP at least, is very low, should not be prevented from uh, you know, developing energy so that their development is halted. So what they are saying basically is that you should try and develop, you reduce the intensity, carbon intensity of GDP. So if one dollar of GDP on a PPP, price purchase power parity, was uh, you know, uh, generating X, uh, shall we say, kilograms of CO2 in uh, 2005, now in 2030, we are supposed to achieve a reduction of 30%. Now, if you look at the huge growth of GDP that we are, we are likely to encounter, okay, forget this year, forget next year, but after that, a country like India, uh, and with all the commitments given on the alternate source of energy, which is uh, nuclear, a uh, lot of hydel, and definitely solar and other things, I think uh, this should not be a problem at all. I, I don't think we are going to be seriously affected. Uh, I forgot to mention that out of the 196 uh, uh, signatories of the Paris Accord, all are there except one. One country reneged and withdrew from the, uh, from the uh, agreement. That is the United States. The United States of America, just after Trump was elected as president, decided to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Now, there's a minimum three-year clause for withdrawal. They did not abide by that. They started coal mining in a big way, okay, for their own reasons. So they are completely out of this. They don't follow any, any. so you can be a rogue nation like that, and you can get out of the Paris Accord. But remember uh, Thunberg's words. Greta Thunberg, I want all of you to go to the, uh, YouTube, put on that video and listen to Greta Thunberg. Uh, a 19-year-old school girl is now crying and weeping and saying that why have why do I have, have to face this problem of uh, having saving the uh, mankind? So please listen to that. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, you know stuff on the internet that you can read. Uh, I don't think by going green we are in any way halting our progress. There is enough alternatives to do that. That's my only comment on that. You have to draw your own judgment on that. Okay, we are uh, running up of time, but uh, yeah. I will get two more questions on. Just okay. if you can uh, quickly answer. One is from Mr. Ashok Kumar. Okay. Uh, I'm just putting him on to the... Mr. Ashok Kumar, can you hear us? Can you please unmute? Mr. Ashok Kumar, can you please ask the question or should I ask the question? His question is that, sir, apart yeah, from yeah. SPMs, what about sulfates and nitrates? What are the effects probably on, on uh, human body probably? As, as, a, as a pollutant. As a pollutant, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, now, um, the, the, the quantum in which uh, those kind of stuff appear in the atmosphere is very small. Yeah. The, the IC engine does produce some sulfate uh, because the, 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 the engine oil is basically calcium. We've got additives which are based on calcium and the sulfur from the fuel reacts with that so you get calcium sulfate and this calcium sulfate is actually the one that goes as ash and goes and sits in the dpf okay which is why we have to have a different type of lubricant so uh, we don't allow it to go out so the threat from uh, nitrates uh, and uh, sulfates is much less uh, the nitrogen oxides of nitrogen are more potentially lethal and harmful when they're in the gaseous state, especially NO2. Nitrogen dioxide is the most dangerous one. Uh, and in, in potency, it can cause uh, things like carcinoma on a much larger scale even than particles. Uh, there is also a, a WHO report, which is now linking both these uh, pollutants to cancer of the kidney, which was never uh, known earlier. So we were always thinking about carcinoma. 
of the of the lungs. Now they are also trying some proof from linking that. So uh, as and when no, as we as we study this uh, more in detail and the numbers, as I told you, are huge numbers. Uh, we will go and get more information if there is if uh, those kind of substances like nitrates and sulfates then pose a problem, then we will have to then you know create uh, and if they are going to come from the IC engine, we'll have to then create a uh, treatment devices and dousing systems to ensure that they don't come out of the exhaust. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will allow one more this thing, Mr. Chandra Mohan uh, yeah. from um, Trivandrum. Okay. Mr. Chandra Mohan. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Please. Uh, I was just referring to the electric vehicle era, which he was answering earlier also. So partly my question is answered. Now I, I will supplement with another question. Are yeah. we worried about the automobile cell? What about the heavy air traffic? Uh, you mean uh, aircraft? Yeah, air traps. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that is also really part of this uh, whole thing that uh, we are burning aviation turbine fuel uh, and uh, you know we are creating a lot of carbon uh, dioxide there. Uh, just, to, just to tell you the story of Greta Thunberg once again, uh, Greta Thunberg when she went back uh, from that meeting or even uh, some previous meeting in Davos, she went to this uh, school, uh, to the media in Sweden and she made an appeal to all the Swedish people and the Scandinavian people, you know, Norway, Norway and Finland included, saying that please do not fly. Okay, stop flying. Try and use trains. And I was reading a report uh, recently from the SAS, which is the National Airline of Sweden, to say that um, before COVID, uh, they lost uh, something like 5% business, which they attribute to Greta Thunberg's uh, appeal. And the Swiss, uh, the Swedish railway, Okay, Sweden has got a long north-south railway right up to the northern end of Sweden. Uh, so they, they reported uh, almost a 10% increase in train travel. So uh, one little school girl like that can uh, make a make a you know such a big change. There is hope for the world. Yes, air travel uh, air travel does uh, produce uh, uh, CO2 emissions, and, and uh, the number is not very big. I have the number somewhere. Um, I don't. Think I can find it because I kept a lot of notes. But uh, if you can uh, leave your uh, email ID or something with, uh, you know, Ajit, I'll be very happy to answer that. Okay, I can, okay, okay, sir. You, Thank you, sir. Thank okay, you. Per, per joule of energy uh, between a diesel engine and a gas turbine, how much of uh, emissions come? I'll, I'll find that figure and give. Okay, you. fine. Thank good, you. Good sir. question. Good question. Okay, I think actually there are two more questions, but we have exceeded time substantially by about 20, 21 minutes. So do you, do you want two minutes to, I mean, uh, to answer a couple of more or? I am okay, but I don't want, uh, see, a lot of us are now helping our spouses in cooking. <laughs> children are hungry. I don't want to be accused of holding back uh, any spouse, male or female, from joining the cooking because of my talk. <laughs> I have no problem. My, my dinner is already, we decided to cook it a little earlier. So okay. my wife is already, uh, not. she won't complain. I already helped. Okay, to the group, we will not take any more call. I have been just, I have just put uh, Mr. Pramod, yeah. Matthew, Alex on the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, good evening. Mike? Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah, good evening, sir. Yeah. Uh, my name is Pramod from 8690 Batch Mechanical. Okay. Uh, just one query. How do you yeah. think uh, after about 10 years, how, uh, what percentage of vehicles would be uh, conventional petrol diesel or non-conventional? And what okay. percentage of commercial okay. vehicles? Okay. Well, it's not? a very good question. And uh, this is a subject of debate uh, from many people. I am in some of these uh, groups. Uh, you know, where we discuss this very often. So we recently had, uh, I think it was last year, we had a summit meeting in Goa by one of the global companies. Mm -hmm. And we were, three days we were discussing one point, in which year, in which year will e-mobility, uh, you know, electric motors overtake IC, IC engines. And uh, we said in passenger cars, it will not happen before 2030. 
2035, if I'm not mistaken, that in the year 2035, we believe that the number of uh, electric cars will be produced or sold, not, not the park actually sold, will be less than, will be more than the number of IC uh, cars. So okay. the world produces about, uh, okay, pre-COVID, we were doing about uh, 70 million fast cars per year, okay? Of which China alone is selling about uh, 40. China is the largest uh, fast car manufacturer today. And China has got about 1.5 million electric cars. And the rest of the world, all together, has got about half a million electric cars. Mm -hmm. So, the, but the, 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 the uh, gradient is very steep. So 2035, probably, you will, you will see less IC engines and more electric cars with Forward. certain assumptions, certain scenarios, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the IC engine will not die till about 2070, 2070. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you remember, 1870, the, the gasoline engine was invented in Germany by Nicholas Otto. And 1892, mm -hmm. the diesel engine was invented in Germany. So it will be almost 200 years before the time. <laughs> so they'll be around. During your lifetime, they, okay. they will not go. Don't worry. It will not go out. <laughs> and what about commercial vehicles? Commercial vehicles is going to be a problem. There are no electric, or uh, simple electric alternatives there. Uh, you know, the, the weight of the battery is going to be huge. If you're talking about a 400 horsepower sure. truck engine, you know, the, the weight of the, uh, you just will not be able to handle that with today's technology. If somebody comes up with new technology with a lightweight, high power intensity battery, affordable battery, Yes, then we can talk about it. But city buses, yes, uh, more facile city buses, just from the interest of reducing the emission within the city, they may go electric. Uh, but the long distance trucks and long distance buses will be the last to one, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank so you, this, okay. this, okay. Thank you, Mr. Pramod, Matthew. Uh, so this last okay. question is actually yeah. uh, from uh, Daniel Babu. This is only okay. for, I'm allowing this question for because of his papers in the group. Okay. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you will stop sending us the paper tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> May I just. Uh, yes, Daniel. 61% uh, you told uh, is the contribution of CO2 from the power sector in India. And uh, yeah. you were mentioning nuclear first. I, didn't, I think nuclear contribution is much less compared to. Uh, no, see, 61% uh, uh, is the contribution from power generation as compared to something like 23% in other countries. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Now, predominantly, uh, we are about 70% of our energy is still coming from coal. Okay. And about 25 to 30% is uh, hydro, uh, hydel, little bit of nuclear. Nuclear is hardly. Like nuclear is not very much, it's very less. Uh, and then some alternate energy like, uh, you know, what do you call uh, uh, solar and all that. You know, the problem, if, uh, you know, uh, if you study this problem in detail, what is happening is the, the most of the losses are happening in transmission and distribution. We have the largest synchronous grid in the world. At 375 or 400 gigawatts power, the largest synchronous grid in the world is maintained by us. But some of our transmission lines are very old. Uh, therefore, we are not able to generate, we are not able to transmit all the power we generate very efficiently to the load centers. So the, the, the emission that you have is based on how many units you generate. It is not based on how many units you consume. Okay. So if we are able to, I think, in, uh, uh, improve our, our transmission and distribution efficiency, make it into uh, things like 85 to 90 percent which is the global standard today even more than that but we are i think still back at somewhere between 70 and 75. i'm not an expert in this but this is what i've heard so that is probably accounting for this huge uh, uh, you know percentage of emission from the uh, coal industry now two things are changing there uh, uh, the college you know that we have now uh, just last week the prime minister announced the privatization of coal mining so now foreign companies are allowed to come and do coal mining. Here. Now, uh, when they do coal mining, the methods used by Coal India are still very old methods. So they might come with larger machines, better technology to, to extract coal. The coal we have in India is not a very good quality coal. The calorific value is slightly low because there's a lot of ash. Okay, we are importing some coal also. Uh, and then, of course, there is some talk of uh, the uh, coal methane uh, project, which is uh, converting coal into natural gas. 
China is leading in that uh, effort. India is also making some efforts. So maybe this huge reserve of coal one day might even get converted to methane. It will not help the, uh, the CO2 emissions because they'll be the same. But the other ash uh, content and other emissions like, uh, you know, uh, which are dangerous can be eliminated. So it's a nebulous issue. I don't have a ready answer to that, but these are some of the ingredients of that problem. Okay, Daniel. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, NCS, sir. That is, that has been really wonderful. I think I have several comments which are coming from various people. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank all the participants and our uh, Mr. Uh, Nadarajan who inaugurated this, the technical support provided by uh, Papan and uh, Tarun and creative works done by Papan and all other committee members. Uh, I thank them all uh, on behalf of the CETA Mumbai. We, uh, please look out for our messages in the future. We, we should have this kind of meetings uh, announced pretty soon again. Thank you very much to all of you. Good night. Thank you.